Hi everyone, this is Heidi from My Reading Life and I'm here tonight to film uh, the first half of my May wrap up. May has been an excellent reading month so far um, and I have had quite a few books already done and it, uh, so I wanted to stop in the middle of the month here and film this video because otherwise my wrap up would be far too long at the end of the month. So let's just get to it. The first audiobook I've completed so far in the month of May is this one. It's Fantasyland by Kurt Anderson, How America Went Haywire, A 500-Year History. And this is a nonfiction book that outlines how America is exceptional in a way that we don't often think about, and that is that our citizens often are willing to believe things that are untrue. Um, from the very beginning of the foundation of this country, which goes beyond when the Pilgrims and the Puritans arrived in New England, to when folks were coming over here in the 1500s and early 1600s, well, I guess it was 1600s and into the 1700s, looking for gold. They just absolutely believed that they were going to find gold in um, the New World, and no matter how many expeditions were financed, and came back either broken and broke or just completely were all annihilated in the new world and never came back at all. It didn't seem to matter. And from that point on, um, we have sort of as a country been willing to believe lots of things that aren't true um, from patent medicines uh, that were just simply tonics and elixirs that weren't didn't have any medical um, you know, didn't provide any medical relief to, you know, today's politi politics where we have a president who basically lies all the time, but yet people still think he's doing a good job. Like 40% of the people in, in America think he's doing a good job. So there's something about Americans that are willing to believe the patently untrue. And this book details all kinds of things. There's lots of fascinating stuff in here about different religious offshoots that have formed in the United States and basically nowhere else in the world. There's an interesting part in here about Mormonism. There's interesting parts in here about, um, you know, uh, P.T. Barnum and Houdini and, and basically these hucksters and charlatans that um, put on shows basically that the American public just love from you know, the, the Wild West shows and all these sorts of things. Americans are just very happy to like exist in a fantasy land. So I thought that was a very good nonfiction book. Um, there were, it was quite long. I listened to it on audiobook. There were parts that kind of dragged a little bit, but for the most part, it kind of, it skips around from many different topics. So it stays interesting. So I, I would recommend it. Um, it wasn't a perfect book, but it had, um, a lot to recommend it. Another thing that I completed in the first half of the month was this ebook, um, An Extraordinary Union by Alyssa Cole. This is a romance novel um, written by a person of color, and the protagonist female is a black woman who is acting as a spy during the um, during the Civil War in America. She was born a free woman in the North and has committed herself to the cause and has gone to the South, to uh, Baltimore, Maryland area, um, and is acting as a, as a slave in a household, but she's really a spy for this loyal, loyal league or loyalty league, I can't remember. But there's a network of spies that use uh, people of color um, in them. And as she's in this household acting as a slave, she meets what she first thinks is a white Confederate soldier in the home that she's working in, a visiting white male of a Confederate soldier. And sparks fly, and it turns out that he is not what he seems either. He is also a spy. He's actually a Pinkerton agent. Um, and so they end up having to work together to try to complete a mission and, of course, fall in love. But... The thing that's really cool about this, I mean, I love romance novels. I read lots of them. Um, but this particular book, what was interesting to me was that the problems that would have existed for these two individuals to be together were not swept under the rug. They were addressed straight on um, and in a very realistic manner. And I just found it absolutely refreshing to read 
such a realistic uh, romance novel. There is very little of the sort of fantasy-esque aspect of, of, say, like a Regency romance where, you know, a, a woman from a poorer class meets a grand duke and even though supposedly there's all these barriers standing in the way of their love, most of it is overcome simply by the fact that they love each other. Well, for these two, it's, you know, she could be killed for having the, you know, the gall to be with a white man. And he could be killed for if people think that he really has feelings for her and isn't just using her the way white men used slave women. So there's like realistic uh, barriers to their relationship and the book does not shy away from those. It's very, very well done and I definitely will be reading the rest of the books in the series because there are multiple books in this um, Loyalty League series. So I'm definitely looking forward to reading some more of those. I also completed a graphic novel, um, Relish My Life in the Kitchen by Lucy Kinsley. This is a graphic memoir um, written, uh, by, written and illustrated by the author who is a um, basically tells her life as it relates to food. Her mom was uh, a caterer and a chef and basically always worked in the food industry. Um, her dad is, you know, loves fine food. When her parents were married still, they get divorced when she's a child, but when they were married, when she was a young child, they fed her everything that they ate. So she didn't just subsist, subsist on normal kid food. She, you know, would eat things like goose liver pate and, you know, whatever they were eating. So she developed this love of fine food, but that's not to say she doesn't love all kinds of food because she loves a good McDonald's meal too once in a while. Um, but so she is describing in this graphic memoir basically memories that she has that relate to food, whether it be eating food, cooking food, smelling food. There's an excellent section um, where when she was like 12 or 13 travels to Mexico with her mom and her mom's girlfriend and the friend's son and she and the son like basically are left alone to explore Mexico because the two moms become ill immediately upon arrival and the the hijinks that they get up to um, basically all the candy that they can possibly consume while their moms are not um, paying attention uh, it's just awesome um, very well done really heartwarming and fun a quick read something that you can sit down in one evening and breeze through um, I very much enjoyed this graphic memoir the next thing uh, I wanted to talk about was this um, mystery novel, Bluebird, Bluebird by Attica Locke. This uh, is a mystery I've been hearing a lot about recently. It's pretty new. I think it just came out um, either the beginning of this year or the end of last year. So September 2017, this book came out. So it's fairly new. Um, and it tells the story of, uh, oh, what is the guy's name. Darren Matthews is our main character. He is a Texas Ranger living in East Texas and he is um, a black man and um, is very much dedicated to his job but he has made some decisions that have wound him up in hot water as the book opens. He is being placed on suspension because of some choices that he has made um, but in the meantime uh, some bodies have washed up on the bank of a river, one black woman and one white man. And uh, he's sort of called in to investigate at first on the on the DL, on the down low, um, and then a, in a more official capacity. Um, and this mystery, I very much enjoyed it. It did follow some of the standard tropes of, you know, he's a troubled soul. Um, he's in his marriage is in trouble. He's got a drinking problem, but it avoids the sort of poor, pitiful me um, attitude that a lot of these kind of mysteries have when you have a bad boy uh, detective at the front of it. Um, of course, there's a woman involved. The wife of the the man who's killed uh, shows up. Actually, I said this wrong. It's a black man that's dead and a white woman that's dead um, in this small East Texas town. There's a lot of racial overtones. Um, there is uh, trying to pin the murder on black people in the community. 
Um, there's a nasty little honky tonk involved that's you know appears to be selling crystal meth out the back door. You know all that kind of stuff is in here. It's gritty. Um, I have never read anything to my knowledge that takes place in this part of Texas. So I found that fascinating. Sort of the small town. Um, East Texas uh, setting of this is really good. So if you like a mystery, if you like this sort of, you know, uh, bad boy detective kind of um, narrative, um, but with a little bit of a twist with some racial overtones that um, are handled very well, uh, I, I would definitely recommend this. I'm going to be checking out more of Attica Locke's stuff. I think she's an excellent mystery writer. Then is a book that I read for... Um, the Around the World in a Thousand Pages book club run by Russell over at Ink and Paper, Paper Blog. And we read um, for Europe, we read Catalan Street by Magda Zabo, I think is how you say it, and translated by Len Ricks from Hungarian. Um, this is uh, published, this particular edition is published by the New York Review of Books. Um, and this is a great little um, slim volume. This book takes place uh, during World War II in Prague. Um, and we're following three families that live on this Catalan Street. Um, they live side by side. Um, they are totally intertwined. There are, you know, there's, uh, I'm trying to remember the names of all the families. I'm so bad with names. There's, so there's, there's one family that has two daughters. Um, the oldest daughter's name was, good lord, why can't I remember? I'm so bad with names. Irene. And then she has a younger sister, Blanca. And then next door to them are uh, a major, a military guy and his son and their housekeeper. And the son's name was, oh, what was the son's name? Balint. Balint's the son. And then Next door to those two families moves in a Jewish family with a little girl named Henriette. And so the narrative sort of starts as they're small children and, and the Jewish family moves in and Henriette becomes friends with the other children. Um, and they all start to grow up together. And then when they're, the older children are teenagers, um, the war has obviously started, there's the nasty business is happening, but the children don't really understand what's going on. And so we're seeing it, you know, the story's being told through their perspective as they're looking back. Um, and so they don't always know what's going on. And so the war, while it's the backdrop, is never the, it's never the main storyline. It's informing what's happening amongst these families, but it's not the main point. Um, but a tragedy does happen and little the the parents the Jewish parents are taken away and you know that they're gone to um, they've been sent probably to a concentration camp or something and the major decides to hide Henriette and try to take care of her even though he's still you know he's still um, in the military and, and will be um, you know probably killed himself if it's found out what he's doing and in amongst all this, you know, a tragedy happens. And it's that tragedy. Um, Henriette is killed. It's not a spoiler to say so because you know it right from the beginning. You know that she is killed. I won't tell you how she's killed. But, um, and that sort of forms the rest of these folks' lives. All of these families are shaped and changed by this death that happens. Um, and it's so good. This was such a great story. It's a quiet little story and it's all about uh, family relationships. It's about how um, events that happen can shape your whole life um, for good or for ill. It's about how some little thing that you do when you're a child can have these repercussions throughout lives. Um, it can change everybody around you. Um, even if it's just a small thing, the smallest little thing. And I just thought this was beautiful. Um, when I picked this up, I, I honestly did not expect to really like this. It did not sound like my cup of tea. And I really loved it. I would have never picked it up if it were not for Russell's Book Club. So I'm grateful that I was participating and I took a chance and, and bought this book. And, and it was just wonderful. So I would urge you all, if you like 
literary fiction, if you like historical fiction, if you are interested in reading more translated fiction, um, please give this a try. This is really a wonderful um, book that really deals a lot with um, the human experience and how uh, small events and large events shape the people, yourself and the people around you and what you'll do for family, um, even if that family is not your blood family, but just the family that you've chosen um, and, and how those decisions impact people all around you. It's a beautiful book. And then the last book that I want to discuss is The Big Chunker that I've been reading. I know I've talked about this a couple of times in my most recent videos. This is Lonesome Dove by Larry McMur McMurtry, um, a modern classic of a Western. Um, I picked this up because I needed to read a Western to complete the 2018 Read Harder Challenge. And I had tried this book several years ago and had not been able to get past, I think, page 80. And this time no problem. I was totally sucked into this book. This is a wonderful story where you follow two um, retired, semi-retired Texas Rangers who live in, they've been off, you know, uh, basically fighting Indians for 20 or 30 years and trying to make the West safe for settlers. And they've semi-retired to this ranch that they've bought on the border of Mexico in Southern Texas. Um, and they're kind of living this boring, quiet life. You've got Call, one of the Texas Rangers named Call. He is sort of the stoic. He is the hard worker. He's the, he's the uh, aunt to uh, the other characters, Grasshopper. Um, he is very straight and narrow and, you know, you've got to do things by the book. And then you have Augustus or Gus, his partner. Um, who is more of a, a dilettante. He would prefer to sit on in the shade and drink his whiskey and discuss philosophical matters. Um, but, you know, the story opens with, with that sort of scene being set. And then they decide to um, strike out one last time. Um, the, the frontier is being settled and they, uh, Call really wants to see... Uh, an untamed place once more before he dies, basically, even though he's not close to death, but he thinks, you know, the frontier is going away. So they end up um, deciding to drive cattle from Texas all the way up to Montana, which they've heard is beautiful and wonderful cattle country and not settled yet. Um, and so they get together this cast of characters, these cowboys and ne'er-do-wells, and decide to start driving these cattle north. And every... Thing happens to them on this cattle drive. Every kind of horrific event, every kind of tragedy, every emotion that a human can experience, you will experience in this book. Um, it is beautifully written. It is because they're Western folk and they're cowboys, or they're not cowboys so much as Texas range, but they have that stoicism and this lack. It's not a lack of emotion, but it's this you're not, they don't express emotion. So even when something horrible happens, they're very matter of fact about it. They don't express a lot of, of grief or any kind of emotion really. And that's the juxtaposition of that with some of the horrific events that happen is just so striking and just wonderfully done. And I've marked a passage here that I want to, I want to read because it just, I think it, it really illustrates the power of this book. Um, so from Lonesome Dove. Of course they had heard that the buffalo were being wiped out, but with the memory of the southern herd so vivid, they had hardly credited the news. Discussing it in Lonesome Dove, they had decided that the reports must be exaggerated, thinned out maybe, but not wiped out. Thus the sight of the road of bones stretching over the prairie was a shock. Maybe roads of bones were all that were left. The thought gave the very emptiness of the plains a different feel. With those millions of animals gone, and the Indians mostly gone in their wake, the Great Plains were truly empty, unpeopled, and ungrazed. Soon the whites would come, of course, but what he was seeing was a moment between, not the plains as they had been or as they would be, but a moment of true emptiness, with thousands of miles of grass resting unused, occupied by only remnants of the buffalo, the Indians, the hunters. Augustus thought they were crazed remnants, mostly, like the old mountain man who worked night and day gathering bones to no purpose. 
I mean, just the imagery is so vivid and so wonderful. Um, I really urge you, I know it's an 850 page book. It's a huge chunkster. It's about the West. I'm not a huge Western fan myself, but oh, it is a beautiful book. It is, it gave me a book hangover. I'm not going to lie. After I finished this and I rushed through it, the last 200 pages, I couldn't put it down. I just sat on the couch and just read and read and read until it was done. I just didn't want to leave these characters. I know there are more books um, t that were written about some of the characters. Um, I don't even know how many more. Maybe I'll pick them up. I don't know. I don't know if my heart can take it, to be honest. I will say the only thing that I, I didn't care for with this is um, the portrayal of Native Americans in this book is very one-sided. Um, basically, Native Americans are murderers and rapists in this book um, with very little nuance and they're very much caricatures. Um, and that that did bother me, but not enough to make me um, not want to read this book anymore. I mean, the, the rest of the characters are just amazingly well done. There's a huge cast of characters and they sort of weave in and out of each other's stories. Um, and it's just... Oh, what can I say? It's a wonderful book. If you haven't tried it, you should give it a try. So that's what I've read so far in May. Um, like I said, it's been very successful so far for the first half of the month. I'm hoping the rest of the month is equally as good as the first half has been. Um, please tell me in the comments down below if you've read any of these books, if you liked them, didn't like them, if there are any there now that you might like to read or if you had already been planning to read, I'd love to hear all about it. I hope you're doing well and I will talk to you later.